evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Karen Siegel. I'm co-chair of the International Affairs Forum, and we are just delighted to uh, have you here tonight. So tonight we turn our attention to the issue of the refugee crisis in Europe and the woman who stands at the center of it, Angela Merkel, Germany's first female chancellor. We're delighted to have with us here tonight Ingrid sandoli Starosta or as Ron Jolly called her this morning, Dr. Ingrid. Uh, had trouble with the name for some reason. So Dr. Ingrid is good. I'm thinking Dr. Ruth, Dr. Laura, Dr. Ingrid is terrific. So as you're answer or, uh, asking questions tonight, please feel free to uh, do that. Uh, Forty years ago, wow, that really sounds like a long time ago, Jack met Ingrid and her husband Dennis in Frankfurt. Dennis was teaching there and Jack was a student pursuing a master's degree uh, in Europe. They became fast friends. One of those relationships where even if you don't see each other all the time, as soon as you do see each other, it's like no time has passed at all. I feel very fortunate to have married into the relationship. Um, Ingrid is a professor of sociology and gender studies at George Mason University in Virginia. She received her doctorate in sociology from the University of Virginia. She has done groundbreaking research in the role of women in society, with particular focus on women who have made the transition from communism in the Warsaw Pact to the West. Um, she published a book about 10 years ago, and I was reading it before uh, Ingrid arrived, and it's just so filled with with uh, interesting information because it makes you think, oh my gosh, the, the, the Warsaw Pact under communism, and then all of a sudden the Berlin Wall came, you had reunification, and so you had all these people, and let's think women, because that's what uh, Ingrid focused on, who were women under a socialist system, and then became women under a capitalist system. And it, one thing that Ingrid uh, remarks in there is under both systems, they were, um, dominated by male elites. And so, particularly when we think now about Angela Merkel, somebody who was born, not born in the East, but she, was grow, uh, she grew up in the East, uh, how she navigated through this period and what it says about Germany as a country, Germany in the future, and uh, women in Europe as a whole. So I'd like to uh, have Ingrid come forward. We're very interested to hear what she has to say tonight, and then she will be taking questions. So thank you very much. <laughs> Well, good evening, everyone. I hope my microphone works. Um, well, let me first thank the International of, uh, Affairs Forum of Northwestern uh, Michigan College and Jack Siegel and uh, Karen Puschel for inviting me. Um, and thank you, Karen, for that very uh, generous introduction. Well, I'm Ingrid Sandole Staroste. It's actually quite easy to say. <laughs> and I feel honored to be here. This is my first visit to Traverse City, and actually I look forward to uh, learning a little bit more about it. I have seen a little bit of the city this morning, and it looks lovely, although it's rather cold. Um, my topic, as you know, is the refugee crisis in Europe, and particularly the refugee crisis in uh, Germany, which has taken in more than a million refugees um, who come from Syria, from Iraq, uh, from other war-torn areas and failed states. And although the winter has reduced the number somewhat, um, the, you know, the, uh, it is expected to pick up again once spring arrives. I should also say that although I am a German and therefore an EU citizen, I'm also an American citizen, so still I keep an eye on what's happening over there in Germany and Europe, and um, I'm here to share my observations with you. So let me briefly tell you how I organized uh, my talk. 
First, I think I would just like to define the terms of asylum seeker and refugees. They are often confused or used interchangeably, but there's a distinction and I think it's important to know. And then I will focus on Angela Merkel and her remarkable leadership uh, in handling the refugee crisis. And here I will explore a little um, sort of who she is and the influences that shaped her uh, to lead the way she does. And then I want to focus a bit on the new Germany um, that has allowed Angela Merkel to lead the nation through this crisis quite successfully so far, right, so far, albeit without, not without problems. And then I want to look at the competing views on the refugee crisis that she has to reconcile. And then I try to draw some conclusions. So let me begin by clarifying the concepts of refugee and asylum seeker. They, as I said, they are related, but they also differ in very important ways. So according to the UN um, a refugee agency, as asylum seekers are people who claim to be refugees because they left their country involuntary. And whether an asylum seeker then qualifies for refugee status is determined after they have undergone a very stringent and extensive background evaluation to their, either by their host country or the country of entry. And so consequently, the number of asylum seekers is always higher than the number of those who eventually get accepted as refugees. Uh, refugees. So when you look at Germany, uh, for example, about 42% of asylum seekers uh, get accepted as refugees. So in, in this case, that would mean about 420,000 would be accepted or granted refugee status, and then the rest of the people will be deported. And I should say, though, that deportation is also a very complicated matter and is not easily accomplished. So in order to understand how Germany has coped with a million plus asylum seeker, I think one has to understand three things. One, who Angela Merkel is, uh, her leadership uh, in this crisis, and then also the new Germany. So let me explore these three topics as best as I can in the time that we have available. Um, so who is Angela Merkel? Well, obviously she is the chancellor of uh, Germany. She is also the leader of the CDU, that is the Christian Democratic Union, uh, Germany's main conservative party, and she leads a coalition government, that is to say, that is a coalition government of the center-right and the center-left. We probably need someone here like that in the United States. <laughs> so she leads the government that is then made up of the CDU and of the SPD, which is the Social Democratic Party of Germany. Now, so what, what is she doing and what has she done that people see as extraordinary? And I think to answer those questions, it is um, helpful to look at some of the influences that have shaped her and to become the leader she has become today. And for that, it's worth noting, and Karen pointed it out already, that Angela Merkel grew up and came of age in the former GDR, which is the German Democratic Republic, or as it was simply called during the Cold War era, East Germany or Communist Germany. So according to Time magazine, who chose Merkel as the, uh, the person of the year in 2015, her father, uh, Horst Kassner, moved his family from Hamburg, West Germany, uh, to East Germany, to the GDR, in 1957, when Merkel was about three years old. 
So at that time, most people moved from east to west, but uh, her family moved in the opposite direction. So she grew up and was shaped in communist Germany. And her father, he was attracted to socialism. He was the pastor of, the Lutheran, of a Lutheran church. Uh, and the Lutheran church enjoyed a measure of respect even from Marxist-Leninists. And later, the churches, of course, became uh, a place where dissidents found refuge. Her mother was an English teacher, uh, but she was never allowed to teach the language. So Merkel grew up in an, environmental, in an environment where people were very well educated, they were well read, they were cultured, and so rich discussions were always part of her daily life. Uh, her father was also very skillful at working the system, and this allowed Merkel to attend university where she earned a PhD in quantum chemistry, so she actually worked in that field until the collapse of uh, communism. Um, so then in the GDR, Merkel learned not only about science and uh, Realsozialismus, which is, you know, social realism, but also about patience, which is a fundamental lesson or was a fundamental lesson under li a life, uh, uh, of life under communism. So it took only about eight years to get a car when you ordered it. So you had to be patient. So she learned to play what is called the long game. And she once told an audience in Munich uh, when she was talking about her experience in the GDR, and she said, we, and she meant we East Germans always had the experience that things take a long time. But I always was 100% convinced that in the end, democratic principle would prevail. No one knew when the Cold War would end at the time, but end it did. And she said, this is within my and our life experience. And it surprises me, she said, how faint-hearted we sometimes are and how quickly we lose courage when we are faced with challenges. As Chancellor, Merkel was known as a methodical and measured decision maker, uh, possessing a natural and seemingly endless curiosity. And Time magazine described her as the rare, naturally inquisitive politician. She also um, honed her survival skill under a communism. In the former East Germany, there were about 274,000 Stasi informants who, re who reported to the state on their uh, fellow citizenship. And the Stasi was, of course, the, uh, the Staatssicherheitsdienst. That was the, the dreaded state security uh, service. And uh, as an aside, I don't know if some of you have watched the film, The Life of Others. Uh, the Life of Others was a film about a Stasi agent whose job it was to spy on uh, citizens and also to recruit citizens by blackmailing them into becoming informants. And then, of course, about the lives that were destroyed in the system. So it's a very interesting film and well worth watching. The Life of others. Um, and now back to Merkel. So Merkel's uh, socialization, her education, and career as a scientist in the GDR may shed some light on how she uh, formulates and implements policies and on the way sort of how she generally deals with the refugee crisis. So she is known for her intellectual diligence and for her quest for the most reliable data. And to uh, sort of the chagrin of many, uh, she apparently commissions and studies very carefully an inordinate number of polls. And people who know Merkel well say she's good at working the system, at seeking consensus, and at 
persevering. That she always chooses her fights carefully and takes only those she can win. Uh, she moves carefully and prefers to lead from behind because she likes to have the larger picture in front of her. So when the asylum seekers began streaming into Europe and Germany, this cautious and measured chancellor revealed another side. She demonstrated bold moral and practical leadership and took Germans and the world by surprise. It has been a huge gambit for her, and you know it's far from clear uh, how it will all or whether it will pay off. <clears throat> she has steadfastly refused to, um, to, or she has steadfastly held the door open for asylum seekers and told Germans to set aside their fear of immigrants and show compassion for the needy. The uh, Economist has described Merkel as the one leader who stands above all the rest. The only one who has boldly upheld European values, almost alone in her commitment to welcoming refugees. And so, despite, uh, despite the pressure from the right, she has refused to place what is called eine Obergrenze, an, an upper limit on the number of refugees that Germany can absorb. She thinks it's un impractical. <coughs> but that has cost her, and her approval ratings have dropped, and political criticism is mounting. So some even wonder whether her stance will be her political undoing. And a recent poll actually showed that 40% of respondents now want her to resign. But you can also say it differently and say 60% still want her to stay. So people focus on the 40%. No? So, so any move now by her critics, because that's also a discussion for a no confidence vote in parliament, it's still quite an uphill uh, battle, for, at least for now. Now, whether she can hold on to the voters' trust will become clearer next month when there will be three uh, regional elections. But interestingly, at the CDU party conference two months ago in December, there were few indications that she is doomed. So despite criticisms, from her ranks, in her 70-minute um, address, Merkel hardly deviated from her policy, her, the, the refugee policies that she has been pursuing all uh, along. She emphasized that Germany can do it and that it would not close the door on those in need. Her only concession was to find ways to limit migrant numbers and she emphasized that the solution um, to the crisis lies with Europe and beyond, that Germany alone cannot do it. And she was rewarded with a 10-minute ovation, uh, and even she was taken aback by such outpouring. So let me take you back a little to last summer and last fall. Last summer and last fall, Chancellor Merkel had the support of the majority of Germans. That was like, you know, in the high 70% um, when she called uh, on them to apply the same energy to coping with the wave of asylum seeker as was shown in bringing together East and West Germany. She convinced Germans that it was the right that it was right to make Germany a haven for refugees, and said, we stand before new tasks, the scale and scope of which we do not yet know. And an army of German volunteers responded to her appeal in a positive way, and these included individuals, it included businesses, large and small, it included other organizations, NGOs, and so on. And the economist noted that most impressively, and alone among center rights leader, leaders in Europe, Merkel has done this without pandering to anti-EU and anti-immigrant populists. 
and for, the, for all the EU's flaws, she has not treated it as a punch bag, but rather as a pillar of peace and prosperity. Now, at the same time, she has made clear that unless the EU agree to find on a mechanism to share refugees, uh, Europe's border-free Schengen area was going to be in question. And also, she said of the crisis, it is no exaggeration to see this task as a historic test for Europe. <coughs> and Stefan Wagstiel of the Financial Times write that Merkel feels it to be her duty to make the union work. If it doesn't work, it will be the end of Europe as we know it. So EU members, and Germans in particular, are keenly aware that the EU with its government stru governance structures and its, its carefully nurtured values has ensured that none of its members has raised more than a voice against another for seven decades, and that is a modern, modern record. And as you may, may remember, the, uh, the EU was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012 for it. So let me uh, turn to the new Germany now. Merkel's unexpected and daring approach to handling the refugee crisis was realized in the new Germany. And I think it's important to kind of understand that. The, uh, <coughs> sorry. So the so-called Willkommenskultur, which means the welcome culture, um, is a reflection of a new Germany, of a changed Germany. In the new Germany, a fifth of Germans, that is one in five, are first or second generation immigrants. <coughs> and Thomas Schmidt is a political editor of the conservative newspaper Die Welt. He said, Merkel is building a new, different, more colorful, ever less homogeneous, and fairly rugged republic. So Germans, particularly young, young Germans, are more optimistic say, than a generation ago. And according to Minkmar, the, um, he is a, a, a you know, writer for the magazine Der Spiegel, Germany's uh, reunification 20 years, uh, 25 years ago played a pivotal role in this regard. A lot of soul searching has been going on in both East and West Germany over the last quarter century. And this has been a necessary process given Germany's role in the 20th century. German reunification took place, uh, excuse me, I don't know why my voice is going here. <laughs> so German reunification took place in the context of very skeptical neighbors who weren't sure what a united Germany would mean for their future. Quite a few predicted economic disaster, a possible weakening of the transatlantic alliance, and sort of an orientation towards the East. And uh, the terror attacks against foreigners that occurred in the wake of reunification in, in various cities increased the fear that Germany's um, extremist right would once again gain power. But um, Germans responded to the attacks with Lichterketten, and Lichterketten are lane, uh, chains of light. That is, ordinary Germans went into the streets by the tens of thousands in cities all over Germany, linking arms, carrying candles, in support of those who had fled war and violence and who had been granted refugee status in Germany. They wanted the radical right and the world to know that the majorities of Germans opposed violence and racism and that they represented the new Germany, a united Germany. 
And according to Minkma of uh, Der Spiegel, the Germany of today is a, a changed Germany. The people are different. Germany is successful. It is worth living in. And as of the summer of 2015, one can say, Germany has even become likable. <laughs> Young people are more open. They acknowledge others in part because they have grown up in families that are more open. And although some lament the old German traditions that they are disappearing, others see it as a blessing. It allows Germans to meet people with different ways of seeing things, and that reduces hostilities, and it increases the willingness to learn and to stay curious. <coughs> The reality of the Cold War and a divided Germany is fading, and with it, the fear for most Germans is fading. They are optimistic about their future without losing sight of the reality that minority groups live among them who are dangerous and prepared to engage in violence. And they do not deny that injustice, poverty, and illness exist. What has become visible is that the German people have questioned and worked on the historical complexity of their civil society. And so it was the people of the new Germany that sprang into action and welcomed the asylum seeker that flooded into their country. So Angela Merkel's compassionate and daring decisions on behalf of the asylum seekers were made in this context, in the context of a changed Germany. And it took the world somewhat by surprise. And Merkel, the shrewd politician she is, saw a chance for Germany to show a gentler face and to pull the country further away from its Nazi past. And so, wir schaffen das, we can do it, became her motto. And the German people agreed and they responded favorably. And so far, the German system has been handling more or less the strain of asylum seekers. Um, this is in large part due to the many citizen volunteers who spontaneously organized into Bürger Initiative, and those are citizen initiatives, and there are remarkable stories abound. And with the help of tens of thousands of volunteers, state, local, I mean local, state, and federal governments have managed to house hundreds of thousands of people in the shortest possible time by erecting tent cities appropriating sports centers, emptying buildings, uh, or empty buildings, and even the ground of former Nazi labor camps, which was not surprisingly very controversial. Private citizens have opened their homes, in, and in Berlin, das Deutsche Theater took in refugees in, their, in the actors' uh, dressing rooms. Schools are trying to accommodate the estimated 300,000 often traumatize children and provide an education, not quite sure yet how they can meet the needs of these children who do not yet speak German. Mm. And let me just mention two specific examples um, of Germans springing into action to help, uh, or to help or make uh, uh, asylum seekers feel welcome. So a tech business created with 300 volunteers um, in one weekend, working day and night, a welcome act uh, up for asy uh, asylum seekers to find their way around Germany or that particular area they found themselves in. So they created portals with information on the rights and responsibilities of asylum seekers, portals explaining German values, norms, and customs, how to find housing, how to uh, obtain donations of furniture and clothing and the like, and how to and where to learn the German language, among others. Businesses of all sizes donated goods and the time of their employees to help asylum seekers. They also created many internships and, of course, jobs, and that is, you know, of course, not enough, but they have started that. 
So integrating refugees, not surprisingly, worked better in well-off communities because those who have more find it easier to give more. It has been different, of course, for communities that suffer from persistent high unemployment and social tensions. I mean, those Germans who, who find it difficult to make uh, ends meet with the resources they have perceive refugees, of course, as a drain and as an additional and uh, unacceptable burden because they fear that they might slide into abject poverty. And here the challenge is to protect refugees who are at risk of becoming uh, scapegoats, who are held responsible for their fate, their culture, their race, their religion, and also who are defined as barbarians and terrorists. And at the same time, the fear of the poorer communities who believe that the plight of the refugees may become their plight, uh, they must of course also be addressed because in the pure, I mean, in the poorer uh, communities, uh, it is in these communities that the extremists find fertile ground to exploit the fear and propagate hate, prejudice, Islamophobia, and incite harmful actions. So despite the good will and work done by the tens of thousands of volunteers, there is no denying that many Germans, including members of parliament, are concerned and feel unnerved and infuriated with Angela Merkel. They demand that a cap um, is put on the number of refugees allowed into Germany because they are concerned that otherwise things will spin out of control. And uh, the events of New Year's Eve in Cologne and in Hamburg added urgency uh, and uh, the voices to limit the number uh, coming into Germany sort of have grown louder since uh, that time. And in case you're not familiar with the incidents, uh, what happened was in Cologne and in Hamburg, but Cologne particularly, what happened was that men almost exclusively of migrant background, a sort of North African Arabic origin, surrounded German women, threatened and attacked them, and over 550 criminal complaints were filed, and 40% of those were sexual. Now, the German police did very little and was severely criticized by citizens and the government alike for failing to respond to the calls of women. And of course, that's another issue and needs to be explained and explored too. So then German extremists, in turn, uh, used the, event, the events of uh, New Year's Eve and justified attacks on refugees. But so interestingly though, in an interview with the BBC, uh, this is how two Germans then expressed their feelings about the incidents and, uh, and refugees in general, and they said this, there are too many refugees arriving too fast uh, in Germany. Still, we actually agree with Angela Merkel. We think Germany can do it, but in the short term, we will have problems. So, the challenge then that Angela Merkel now faces is to uh, solve and control those tension of these competing viewpoints on the refugee crisis, and not only within Germany, but within uh, the European Union, where she is regarded still as the de facto leader. Mm. And so, the, although there's many uh, competing views uh, for you know, simplicity's sake, I just reduced it to two, and I called them the optimistic view and the pessimistic view. <coughs> so, the optimistic view goes, um, wir schaffen das, we can do it, that is the slogan. And the pessimistic view is, wir schaffen das nicht, and that means we can't do it. Or, more precisely, we are not willing to do it, right? So the optimist view, in a nutshell, 
then is um, it tails, entails um, long rather than short-term considerations. And those who have adopted that view argue that it is mistaken to assume that German culture is under attack and that the economy will not be able to withstand the strain and that social benefits will have to be severely cut and that terrorists will creep in. Instead, they say, that although the challenges that Angela Merkel's decisions to take in a million uh, refugees, or a million plus by now, will remain enormous in the foreseeable future, but so will be the potential benefits. And they point to overwhelming data that show that global migration is a net economic positive. They urge leaders to deal rationally with this crisis and not stir the flames of uh, uh, hatred and uh, fear. Now, according to economists who take this optimistic view on the uh, crisis, economic growth is simply put productivity combined with workers. So when numbers for both productivity and workers rise, and they rise steadily, then countries prosper. And Europe has been struggling to achieve a percentage point in economic growth per year and is not doing well on either front. So according to Time magazine, the continent has the lowest birth rates in the world. In Germany, which is still the economic engine of Europe, um, the population is predicted to shrink from now 81.3 million to 70.8 million. So it will shrink by 11 million by 2060. And if that remains unchecked, then that would trend would devastate uh, the country's welfare um, and also, you know, future economic growth. So given that women in rich countries tend to have fewer children, the only way to achieve better demographics is immigration. So if you see it from that, from that vantage point, governments should do everything to integrate uh, refugees as fast and as efficiently as possible and should not restrict the number of work permits. So that's the optimist view. Now, the pessimist view. Well, the pessimists prefer not to accept any refugees, or at minimum, they want to severely limit the number of refugees uh, that come into Europe, or more precisely then, into their particular country. So they want to draw clear national boundaries again, and they welcome the newly erect at, uh, border controls, which restrict, uh, restrict the freedom to travel in the uh, Schengen area. Indeed, they want to see Schengen, this unique symbol of European integration, as Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the European Commission, has called it. They want to see Schengen disappear altogether. And it's the pessimists who fiercely oppose Merkel's handling of the refugee crisis, and they are gaining support. So, and then we have ambitious politicians such as Horst Seehofer. Horst Seehofer is the leader of the CSU, that is the conservative uh, sister party to Angela Merkel's CDU. They are in Bavaria. Now, he has accused Merkel of a reign of injustice and saying that the welcome culture, the Willkommenskultur, is illegal. And so he's actually considering to take the federal government to the Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe. And that's something one might want to keep an eye on. Some regional and municipal governments joined in the criticism and accused Merkel of encouraging refugees to make this perilous journey. And, you know, few predict dire consequences, what they call the strangely soft or strangely feminized Germany. So in governments in Hungary, the Czech Republic and Poland, and more quietly many other EU nations 
tell their citizens that the refugees will compete with them for jobs, for education, for government benefits, and for the identity of Europe. The identity of Europe. And as most migrants are Muslims, uh, many believe that refugees raise security concerns uh, um, and the fear that terror um, I mean that is the right wing has exploited you know that fear uh, quite well and one I, you know one also has to say that fear is not entirely unfounded because at the beginning of this month uh, February the head of the Germany's domestic intelligence agency possibly averted a potential IS uh, attack in Berlin. Uh, Islamic militants apparently did slip into Europe disguised as refugees and so two Algerians were arrested uh, and, and are suspected of planning uh, terrorist attacks. But you know that still has to be proven and the evidence at least has not been made public. And then, of course, the events on uh, New Year's Eve in Cologne, as I mentioned earlier, also kind of confirmed a fear that many Germans had. Now then, the question is, so how does Angela Merkel respond to, um, you know, the allegation, the pressure, uh, and the, you know, the increasing uh, yeah, pressure and criticism? And what you can say, I mean, in a word, one can say she responded swiftly. So she proposed a sweeping change, uh, changes to um, German uh, immigration laws. And that would increase uh, the judge's powers to deport foreign citizens who are accused of serious crimes, such as a sexual assault. And it also now includes the deportation of um, minus, which was previously illegal. Um, she also toughened Germany's asylum rules and cut uh, cash benefits. And before, if you had one family member who was accepted as a refugee, then he was able to bring in his family, you know, in a rather short time. They then had entry into Germany. Now that has been postponed that family members will have to wait at least two years before they can enter Germany. She also has been instrumental in getting a key European deal approved uh, in which Turkey would crack down on human traffickers. The human traffickers ferry the refugees on these dinghies across the Aegean Sea to Greece and then of course they walk, take buses, they walk up north into Germany. So Turkey is supposed to crack down on these traffickers now. She also, at the beginning of this month, she traveled to Ankara in an effort to cut, with Turkey's help, the number of refugees so that they will be held and processed in Turkey and then, you know, uh, before they come into Europe. Of course, Turkey will receive three billion in exchange, and President Erdogan now also demands that uh, let less criticism from the EU over the conflict with the Kurdish community. And uh, Merkel's goal is to create a process where asylum seekers um, go through a, through a process that, she, that is controlled, that is legal, and that is organized by the European Union uh, in Turkey. And uh, her hope is that then the asylum seekers, that they will get the message they don't have to go on these dangerous journeys across the Aegean Sea, but that they will gain entry into Europe in a different way. She also is trying to redistribute refugees from countries that have actually borne the brunt, and that includes Greece, Italy, Germany, Sweden, and Austria, and other member states. And of course, she is really, um, ex I mean, encountering a lot of resistance, particularly from countries like uh, Hungary, uh, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, the, the, the so-called uh, Visegrad group. 
Another solution that is being discussed in Br Brussels today and tomorrow, because there is the, e, uh, the, the, the heads of states uh, meet today and tomorrow, is to station troops along the Macedonian border with Greece to contain the number of people trying to reach Germany. And what she's trying to do here is to preserve Schengen, the passport-free uh, zone, by securing the external borders of the European Union, because she's, she's keenly aware, and so is everyone else, that the EU prosperity really rests on freedom of movement in the internal market and, of course, on the euro. Also, I think it's important to mention that in early December, of 2015, the German parliament, with large support from the German public, uh, voted in favor of sending planes and a ship to the Middle East to help fight uh, the fight against um, the Islamic State, but not to engage in direct combat, of course. And then she has imposed controls along the borders with Austria and uh, Austria and Slovakia and the Netherlands followed suits with their own controls. And more recently, Sweden has instituted um, a border check along the Oresund Bridge, I, some of you may know it, with Denmark. And then the Danish government also has done the same with the border uh, with Germany. And those controls are all set to be temporary. Uh, and also they are legal under the Schengen Agreement. So now, what do I conclude, having said all this? Uh, <clears throat> well, it appears, it appears that Merkel's leadership is indispensable in this crisis, not only for Germany, but for Europe. And I agree with her that unless the EU agrees on a mechanism to share refugees, the Europe's or the, the, the border free Schengen area will be in question, and then Europe as we know it will be in question. I also think that the successful handling of the refugee crisis will depend in large part on whether or not the 28 nations that form the European Union want Europe and are prepared to share not only the privileges, but also the responsibilities. I am, however, concerned that anti-immigration and anti-European right-wing parties who play on public fear will gain support. But they already gained support before the refugee crisis happened. And troubling signs uh, from the German far right are all too visible now. In 2015, the German police reported 906 attacks on homes of asylum seekers, ranging from arson to physical assault. And that is a fourfold increase over 2014. But I remain optimistic. And I hope that the 20 EU member states will act in the uh, spirit of French President Francois Hollande, who, when he said after the Paris attacks last fall, that France wants a Europe that is open, I mean, wants a Europe of open borders and not a continent of walls and barbed wire. And as of now, as of now uh, there are no other EU leaders who have proposed compelling solutions to the refugee crisis. And the economist, in the recent economist, it was pointed out that only Ms. Merkel appears to think beyond the constraints of national politics and to seek to solve the crisis in solidarity with other EU members. Uh, and I think that Germany and Europe are fortunate to have Chancellor Merkel leading them through this unprecedented historical moment. They are fortunate to have a leader who has been affected by so much human misery and who has dared to make a bold decision and decisions to deal with this crisis and who recognizes that only a strong, united and free Europe is able to maintain peace and a Europe which so many people want to flee to. Thank you.
Okay. Thank you so much, Ingrid. So you can decide if you're an optimist or a pessimist, huh? And maybe we'll hear some of that in questions. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, we have two microphones uh, here and the other one. One more. Anyway, if you would raise your hand, ask a short question. We'll try to do short answers and, and have as much discussion uh, as possible. So, uh, one microphone. Yeah? Everyone. Uh, over here, mm -hmm. Phil? Okay. Hi, my name is Phil, and welcome to Traverse City, the hinterland up here. Uh. <clears throat> I know that Sweden is taking in roughly 160,000 asylum seekers, and then I've read where they're going to try to deport 80,000. They've taken too many. So if Germany has about 420,000 refugees and 600,000 asylum seekers, let's say that three or 400,000 asylum seekers will not be granted refugee status. So what does Sweden and Germany, how would, what do they do? Do you put these people on buses if they can find them and send them to Denmark or what? <clears throat> no, they are, they are actually deported back to the countries they're coming from. And, you know, they can, if they come from a country like Syria, by law, they cannot be sent back, right? Because it's a country at war. But you also have many asylum seekers who come from what they call safe countries, like many people have joined, you know, the flow, like from the Balkans example, there are people from Pakistan, there are many people from various African countries, and many of them sort of fall on, under the category of economic migrants, and they would be deported. But, you know, I should also say, when you look at deportation, is not an easy process either, because they lose their passports, and you cannot deport under law someone who doesn't have papers. Um, then many countries apparently also do not want to take um, the asylum seekers back, because what happens often is when, you know, or they are, they are hoping asylum seekers find jobs in the north and they then want the remittances because then they support their families in those countries. So it's a very complicated matter, but, and it will be interesting what comes out of it now, the, the, these two days in Brussels, uh, that is one issue that is being discussed on how to speed up uh, the deportation, and they are hoping by keeping um, the refugees in Turkey and processing them there uh, before they are distributed uh, throughout Europe, that you know that can be sorted out in Turkey already. Uh, but you know we'll have to see how that plays out. But it's a very complex and complicated process, you know, to to deport. Uh, asylum seekers. Another question. Did I see someone hand here? No? Yeah? Over here? Kim? Here. Hello, my name is Dennis. Hi, and Dennis. What are the refugees' expected re repercussions or benefits with those three elections you talked about? Expected in terms of, can you? Well, see? no. How are the refugees going to be affected with those three three elections that are coming up in the month, this month? You talked about three elections. That are oh, you mean the lender election, the the state elections? Yes. I don't know. That is totally open. You know what is uh, what what the outcome will be. The only thing what is being speculated is if. Um, the CDU, which is Angela Merkel's party, if they lose, and if they lose badly, that will have real uh, implications for, for her chancellorship. So we will have to see how that plays out. This year there will be five uh, lender or state elections. And so, you know, it's, it's difficult to say right now. It's difficult to say. You know, even though 
when you look at the opinion polls, she is losing, but she still has 60% of the people supporting her, which is actually quite high. But she was at, you know, 80, she was over 80%, you know, last summer. That was her approval rating, so it has obviously fallen. But, you know, she still has quite a bit of support, so we'll see. Right. Ingrid, could Difficult I ask a follow-on to that? Because uh, it seems like uh, Angela Merkel, in some ways, uh, judging against the U.S. election backdrop in contrast, it's almost like she's her own Republican, Democratic government all in one person, right? She's conservative. She has liberal policies. She has a coalition government. I mean, is she just an incredibly unique person, or is it the system? I mean, explain this to us. Well, well, she's obviously she's obviously a very good politician, right? Because she's good at building consensus, and to lead a coalition government of the center right and the center left, and she brings, so she has moved the conservatives in her party to the middle, and she has moved the people from the very left, the SPD, to the middle somehow. So yeah, she is. Um, She's a very shrewd politician uh, in that sense. Um, but, you know, I mean, I mean, I don't know how to kind of say that because it works so differently than it does in the United States. There is also, at the moment, when you look her, at her party, according, I mean, according to what I'm reading, is there is not really an alternative to her. The party does not have very strong leaders or leaders waiting in the wing, right? So that came very clearly came out at the, uh, uh, you know, when they met the CDU party annual uh, uh, meeting, right? There, there is no one there right now that could easily or could easily replace her. Yeah. That's kind of the way I think we feel here in America. <laughs> Another question. Please. Yeah. It's often said here in the United States that uh, historically we absorb immigrants well in our so-called nation of immigrants, and that, by contrast, Europe has not had a very good record of uh, assimilating immigrant populations. I was wondering if, from your knowledge of the situation in Europe, if, if that is true, and if that is true in Germany of the uh, large Turkish immigrant population. Yes. So, so Germany has actually had experience with integrating immigrants, and that's true in the 1960s, you know, the so-called Gastarbeiter, the guest workers, who politicians naively believed they would come and then they would go home again, which didn't, of course, happen, right? And so they, they were integrated and lots of mistakes were made the way they were integrated and learned from. And then, after communism collapsed, Germany also had to deal with what the, the so-called Aussiedler, that is to say, um, Germans who had lived for generations, of course, in countries of the som former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, who came, who came to Germany and you know had access. Uh, I mean, they were immediately integrated, and it is interesting, actually, and, and that is that more the Aussiedler rather than the, uh, the the Turkish immigrant is used as a model on how to integrate this new refugee population because that happened only 25 years ago and they have been uh, integrated in society quite well and you, you know there are, you know, when you look at the costs of it all, right, so, so you can see although it involved massive costs but all those costs apparently have been recouped by now because these people were quickly integrated they found jobs, and then they became contributing members of German society. And that's now 25 years. And they actually serve as the model on how to integrate new refugees. You know, the situation is perhaps a bit different, but still. Because these people are also very traumatized people who are coming into Germany, which adds a different dimension. 
and you know language and all those things. Yeah, so it's a it's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge. Other questions? I'd like to acknowledge that there's uh, a group from the German speaking club here in Traverse City, and there's oh, yeah? a group that get together once a month, and they practice their German. I think you're right here, right? Wave your hands, yeah. Oh. And they practice their German, and they drink real German beer. That's what oh. I heard. <laughs> So in fact, how many people in the audience are, are connected with Germany some way or another? I know that's very loose. Wow. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. wir können Deutsch sprechen? Okay. Eine Frage? <laughs> oh, here. Can you? Ja. Und ich habe als Übersetzer 37 Jahre für eine Firma gearbeitet in Deutschland und war eigentlich für Offenheit zur Welt, Weltoffenheit. Und ich habe Nachbarn, die Aussiedler waren, jungen Leuten Deutschunterricht gegeben, damit sie schneller integriert werden konnten. Genau. Und ich fand das alles wunderbar. Auch unsere Unification, also die Vereinigung Europas, Ich hatte zu tun mit Engländern, Franzosen, Italienern, auch mit der ganzen Welt eigentlich. Meine Firma hat exportiert 70 Prozent oder über 70 Prozent. So war das für mich alles wunderbar. Ich finde auch, wir sollten mehr tun für Frieden. Und, ja. und äh, ich bin ein Kriegskind, ich bin im, Welt, im Zweiten Weltkrieg. Weltkrieg geboren, 42. Okay, I'm sorry, but... <lacht> Somebody else got that, so can you briefly summarize Ingrid? Now, this was just a statement on her experience mm -hmm. of actually working with uh, uh, Aussiedler, people who did come in uh, from, from, the east. from the East after communism collapsed, and how she helped also to teach them the language, mm -hmm. to, to teach German and help them otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so. That was a very good example in how that worked. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Any more questions? Hello. Yeah, one Bear. more? Bear. Uh, oh, oh Bear. okay, got it. Um, Ingrid, you, Dr. Ingrid, you just kind of summarized this integration with the Turkish population in Germany. And my question initially was going to be, see that I'm right here. Oh, 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 thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> My question before you started speaking, and so now you might have to put the two together, was you have a, a severe clash of cultures. You've got the Middle East clashing with Europe, and they don't mix because it, those cultures are so distinctly different, and, you know, it's culture and religion. So how did those Turkish people in Germany it, were they Muslim and integrated in well within that? Because this is the major problem, is this culture clash. And, okay, so you kind of talked about that Turkish, you know, integration there, but were those, uh, you know, you see where I'm going, I, I'm assuming. Yeah, the, and, and that is, I mean, now, too, what they call, you know, we cannot develop parallel societies in Germany, because that has happened a little bit in France, that these communities were totally separate. And, you know, back in the 1960s, that actually was the case also with the, t when the Turkish guest workers came over, you had parallel society, but then there was a point that, you know, it was recognized we have to work together, we have to, I mean, communities have to come to, together, and, and that, by that I mean the Turkish community and the German community. But, you know, it is interesting because particularly when you read the American press or the English-speaking press, what they focus on is and you know predominantly of course the the things that don't work right but when you read more also of the german press and when you talk to people in germany it's actually remarkable um you know what what is possible and you know it's not that it's not difficult but there is a lot of goodwill to work together and i know that from my brother who is in 
who lives in Hamburg and works in the educational system and in the school system and how they help because there's a huge population of asylum seekers, how they bring in these children into school and it's also amazing how quickly these, I mean now the children, how quickly they pick up the language and it's already a very, I mean, as I said in the beginning, one in five Germans is already of an immigrant background. So it's not, you know, that there is not the experience over the last 40, 50, 60 years. Germany has become a very multicultural society. But there's, there are obviously challenges. But, um, you know, so far they are handling in it and that includes how they handled the situation in Cologne and in Hamburg, you know, of New Year's Eve. Um, but there is a sizable uh, Muslim population already in uh, Germany, but it will increase, right? It will increase. So, so Ingrid, thank you so much for coming to Traverse City. Thank you.